So God's like, okay, okay, this is really how it's going to be. Like, you're not, like, I literally just went through all of that, bringing y'all out of slavery. Y'all saw some crazy stuff go down. This is going to be a long video today. Hey fam, it's Rachel. Today on Crack Your Bible, I wanted to wish all of you a very happy Rosh Hodesh for the biblical month of Shabbat. And you might be wondering, what are you talking about? I know so many people have no idea what I'm talking about because pastors refuse to talk about this. Most of them have no idea what I'm talking about either. And that is a problem because when we crack our Bible, we see these Rosh Hodesh or the new moon mentioned not only in the Old Testament, but the New Testament. And here's something else that a lot of pastors don't tell you, that God will be worshipped not only from Shabbat to Shabbat, but new moon to new moon. If this is something that's going to be celebrated when Jesus comes and his kingdom is here on earth, how come nobody's talking about it? We are going to be discussing Rosh Hodesh specifically for the biblical month of Shabbat today. And before we do, make sure you hit subscribe with the bell with the parentheses so you're notified of a new gospel message. Because of course, Satan, YouTube, and Google, they're one and the same, but they do not want you to know the gospel. And they will never notify you of a new gospel message unless you hit subscribe with the bell with the parentheses. So let's get it started. I actually had somebody tell me that they used to get very offended over me saying like Satan, YouTube, and Google, they're one and the same. Like that was one of the weirder comments that I've received. Like they're offended on behalf of Google, even though we know that they like censor Christians all the time. But anyway, let's talk a little bit about Rosh Hodesh for the biblical month of Shabbat, because I know a lot of people are like, what are you talking about? Are you Jewish? Are you Hebrew roots? Like, are you Torah observant? No, you guys. Oh my gosh. I hope you guys have been with this channel to know better that I don't mess with any of those people because I've read Galatians. You who would be justified by the law, you have fallen away from grace. You have fallen away from the faith. You cannot earn your salvation by going back to the law. Jesus did not come to abolish the law. He fulfilled it. If you have a mortgage and you've fulfilled the whole payment, you don't need to keep paying checks to the bank. Likewise, Jesus is our one and done sacrifice, so we don't need to keep following the law for salvation. That law was a picture of the things to come, which was Jesus Christ. So, no, I'm not a Hebrew roots person. No, I'm not Torah observant. No, I'm not, you know, Hebrew roots, you know, whatever. So anyway, I still want to talk to you guys about Rosh Hodesh because we see this in the New Testament. We see this in Jesus's coming kingdom that new moons are mentioned. So Rosh Hodesh just means the head of the month in Hebrew. Now the biblical calendar is not lunar. It's not solar. It's both. It's lunar solar. And whenever there would be a new moon, so when you can barely see any of the moon at all, which we've talked about right up here for everybody on desktop and mobile. And of course, links are always in the description box below. If you guys want to learn more about new moons, um, Whenever there would be like just the tiniest little sliver of moon, that was a signal to people that the new biblical month was beginning. Now, our modern calendar, the Gregorian calendar, does not go off of the phases of the moon. We know that it falls all over the place in the calendar. It's not always January 1st, February 1st, March 1st. It fluctuates from year to year. So it's very difficult for a lot of Christians who are unfamiliar with this to calculate, okay, when are these holidays? Because it's not like, well, let me just mark my calendar for, you know, July 1st or something. Oh, that's when the holiday is. No, it fluctuates. So it's, oh, it's very confusing for a lot of Christians. And not only that, biblical months do not line up with our modern calendar because they have different lengths of time. Each month is a different uh, span of time. And not only that, instead of leap days. They have leap months, which adds on a 13th month some years. And not only that, days are different. Days don't begin at midnight and go to 11.59 p.m. or 23.59 p.m. They go from sundown to sundown. So if you guys are confused and you want to know when the biblical 
feast days are. You want to know when the new moons are. You guys can check out my Crack Your Bible Facebook page. I always put up a couple of the dates before they happen on the events calendar. And if you want all of them for the 2020 year, you guys can download the biblical calendar in the Patreon link down in the description box below for any amount. So what is so special about these new moons? Well, we know that Christians are not allowed to engage in paganism, right? I know so many of you are foregoing the pagan holidays that are so popular. Your Halloween, uh, Thanksgiving. Uh, we also have Easter, which is totally pagan. And people are like, okay, well then what am I supposed to celebrate? The biblical holidays, if you want to. Are you required to celebrate the biblical holidays? No, you're not, because we've read Colossians 2. Let nobody, let nobody judge you in matters of food or drink and new moons or Sabbaths, because these are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. So you want to celebrate Jesus' resurrection? That's what Passover is about. So Christians, if you guys want to celebrate something, God has a biblical calendar that is filled to the brim with holidays that you can choose to celebrate if you so wish because we're under a new covenant and we have the freedom in Christ to do so. On the biblical calendar, of course, you have your weekly Sabbaths, which are you required to? No, you're not required to do this because Jesus is our Sabbath rest. Sabbath was a picture of Jesus Christ and how we are resting in his finished work on the cross. So weekly, you guys can choose to do something for the Sabbath. Monthly, you can celebrate the Rosh Hodesh or the head of the month, the new moon festivals. And then there are seven biblical feast days that fall on the calendar. No, Hanukkah is not one. No, Purim is not one. There are seven biblical feast days that all point to Jesus. Purim, just to let you guys know, was like a national holiday for the people in Esther's day. It's kind of like celebrating the 4th of July. It was a civil holiday, not a religious holiday. So anyway, you have your weekly Sabbaths, you have your monthly new moon festivals, and then you have the seven high holy days or uh, high feast days in scripture. Those are the things that you can celebrate. So I don't know, 12 to 13 new, you know, moons <laughs> festivals. Then you have, you know, 52 weeks of Sabbaths <laughs> each year. You also have your seven high holy days. Like, Y'all, if y'all want to celebrate, y'all have plenty of days to choose from. So let's talk about Rosh Hodesh for the month of Shabbat. So how do you even celebrate? Well, people in the Old Testament, they would sacrifice to God on these days. But we know that Jesus is our one and done sacrifice. So there's no more sacrificing animals, goats, things like that, bulls, none of that. Because we know that Jesus is the one and done sacrifice. There are no more sacrifices. He was the final one. And not only that, there's no more temple. So you guys, you can't like try to do a reenactment of these Old Testament festivals because there is no temple. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So you guys, what you can do is for the month of Shabbat and all the other new moons, you can just have a nice dinner with your family at home and you can do Bible stories or study the word of God uh, and specifically look at passages that happened during that month. So for the month of Shabbat, you may have trouble if you're looking it up in your Bible software, like BibleGateway.com or BibleHub.com, if you type in Shavat, you might have difficulty depending on whatever translation of the Bible that you use because languages are a little tricky when it comes to spelling and putting foreign words into a, a Latin alphabet. So for example, Shavat is the name of the holiday, but some translations will spell it as Shabbat. So for example, the ESV, you would have to type in S-H-E-B-A-T. Whereas if you're looking up on, you know, Google, you can type in S-H-E-V-A-T and it will pop up because languages 
will sometimes substitute the B's for a V. You see this in Greek. So in Koine Greek, which the New Testament was written in, you have the letter beta. So it makes the B, B sound. And in modern Greek, that same letter is now called Vita, and it makes the V, V sound. So it goes from beta, B, B, to Vita, V, V. So that is where you get Shavat versus Shabbat. It is the same word. But the thing is, is Shabbat is the Babylonian name, even though it's mentioned by this name in scripture, specifically Zechariah chapter 1, verse 7. They specifically mention it by its Babylonian name. Now in Hebrew, you have Nisan, and then you have the subsequent months are just numbered. Second month, third month, fourth month, fifth month, etc. But when God's people went into Babylonian captivity, the months gained Babylonian names. So I will always tell you how these months got Babylonian names because how did God's people end up in Babylon? I'm going to tell you this story every single month. I want this to be down on the inside. I want you guys to remember it so that the Holy Spirit can bring it back up to your remembrance whenever you're dealing with people asking you, well, why don't you celebrate these holidays? Or that's not what it means to me. God knows my heart. So here's the deal. First Kings chapter 12, God's people had split the kingdom in two. You had Judah to the south where Jerusalem was, and then you also had the northern kingdom of Israel. And the northern kingdom of Israel had an evil king named King Jeroboam, and he did not want his people to travel down to the kingdom of Judah whenever there were high holy days, these seven biblical feast days. He didn't want people to travel to Jerusalem at all. There's only three holidays where you're required to go down to Jerusalem in the Old Testament. But regardless, he didn't want people to go travel down to Jerusalem and taking their money with them because you're going to be staying in hotels, you're going to uh, be eating food, you know, whatever. He wanted to keep that money in Israel. So what he did is he said, hold up, you guys, you don't have to go all the way to Jerusalem anymore. And he set up a golden calf at Bethel and he set up a, a golden calf at Dan. And he said, these are the gods who brought you up out of Egypt. He instituted his own uh, priesthood. He instituted new feast days and this angered God. Did, he, did God care that uh, <laughs> people were like, well, God knows my heart. He knows that I'm actually sacrificing to Yahweh, not any of these made up deities. No, this angered God. And constantly for generations, king after king continued in the ways of King Jeroboam. They did evil in God's sight. So finally, God had enough. And he's like, you know what? I'm done. And not only that, I see that Judah is also engaged in idolatry for other reasons. In Israel, it was for money purposes um, initially. And then Judah they got in on the idolatry. So the temple was raised and then um, the people in Judah and Israel, they were scattered and they went off into Babylonian captivity. And while they were there, this is where the biblical months got new Babylonian names. And of course they are listed in scripture. So God hates idolatry. He hates idolatry. So if you're going to be celebrating the biblical month of Shavat at this new moon festival or feast. Again, there's nothing to sacrifice, so we're just going to chill at home and study the Bible. Let's look up some passages of things that happened during the biblical month of Shavat. So if you are looking it up, you can type in Shavat or Shabbat. But not only that, this is the 11th month of the Hebrew calendar, starting from Nisan 1, which is the religious calendar when they're counting out, um, like, here's the first holiday of the year, second holiday of the year. It starts with Nisan 1. Now, for when the years change on the biblical calendar, that happens during Tishri, which is the seventh month. And that's where you have, like, Rosh Hashanah, the head of the year. That is the civil calendar. So years start in the seventh month. Okay. So it can be, again, very confusing to some people. So 
Shabbat is the 11th month of the religious calendar, starting with Nisan 1. So what are some things that happen during this 11th month? Y'all, you can type in, in quotations, 11th, spelled out, and month, and you will see three different places that it pops up. You're going to see it in First Chronicles. You're going to see it in Zechariah. But there's something else. There's another place where you can find what happened during this 11th month. And let me know, has your pastor ever talked about like the biggest thing that happened during the month of Shabbat or the 11th month? Regardless, has your pastor ever talked about this? Because it's huge. You know what happened during the day? So that would be like January 27th, 2020, because of course, uh, this didn't happen during the night. It would have happened during the day, sundown to sundown. Um, you know what happened in the month of Shabbat? On the first day of the 11th month, Moses rolled up to the people of Israel and he gave them the book of Deuteronomy. The whole book of Deuteronomy is broken down into like three different speeches. And then there's this uh, like poem or song at the end. And then Moses goes up a mountain and dies. And then the people of Israel, they cross over the Jordan River and then they are going to go take the promised land. So on the first day of the 11th month, Moses rolls up and he gives the first speech of the book of Deuteronomy, which is recorded in Deuteronomy 1 through chapter 4. So um, what is what is even going on in Shabbat? So Moses is standing up and he is telling the people of Israel their whole backstory. Because here's the thing. Moses isn't going to get to go into the promised land with them. And they've been in the desert for 40 years. And it's like, why have we been in the desert for 40 years? Why are we now just going into the promised land? Because it's 11 days journey from Horeb to where they were going to go. And then all of a sudden, 11 days journey. Now we're here in the 11th month. <laughs> and it's been uh, 40 years of trekking through the wilderness. What happened? So Moses is like, hold on. Let's talk about why we're here today, everybody. And he gives them a history of all the things that they've been through. So let's go through. This is going to be a long video today. Like we're quite a ways in, but it's going to be a long video. So let's go over what happened for those of you who don't know. Now, remember, God made a covenant with Abraham over in Genesis 12 that he would have an offspring. Go read Galatians 3.28. And uh, this offspring is Jesus Christ. But uh, he would be given this land, okay? This promised land. And he would have an offspring and you know, yada, 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 right? So anyway, you have Abraham. He has a son, Isaac. God makes a covenant with him. Then he has a son named Jacob. He makes a covenant with him. And then Jacob has 12 sons. And one of his sons is Joseph. And his brothers are very jealous of him because Jacob and Isaac, they all had a problem with favoritism in their family. And it caused some tension in their family. So Joseph's brothers threw him in a well and sold him into slavery. And he went to Egypt. He went through all of this rigmarole and he ended up after many trials and tribulations, he ended up second in command only to Pharaoh. Now there was a famine in the land that God had given uh, Jacob's offspring. So they had to travel down to Egypt. Some things happened. Uh, Joseph was reunited with his family and all of the brothers and their family, there was 72 in all, they moved down to Egypt. Now, after some time, new pharaohs arose and they forgot Joseph. They forgot who Joseph was. And by that time, the people of Israel, which is Jacob's other name, he was renamed Israel, uh, were put into slavery. Now, after some time, Moses was born and Moses was raised in Pharaoh's household and finally, God shows that it's time that his people are taken out of bondage and they are going to inherit, they will receive this promised land because he's going to make good on his covenant with 
the patriarchs of our faith. And there are many things that happen. There are many plagues that go on in Egypt. And God takes his people out of Egypt. Now they are supposed to go in and take the promised land. And this is what Moses is doing. He's reminding them of all the things that have happened because he's tired of their nonsense. He's tired of their attitude. And he's really fed up that he's not going to get to go to the promised land. So it was an 11 days walk. And before they get to where they are going to go into the promised land, Moses has sent men from each tribe, one from each tribe, to go in and be spies in the land, to go check it out, to see, okay, how are we going to take it? Because this land is currently inhabited by the Amorites. And there's also Rephaim. There are giants in the land. And the spies come back, one being Caleb, one being Joshua. And these spies, who are not Caleb and Joshua, they rile the people up, say, there are giants in the land. We are like grasshoppers in their sight. It, they have huge fortified cities and walls. And two men brought a bunch of grapes that they had to carry on a pole between the two of them. Like, even the food is huge in the promised land. And people start freaking out. They're like, what is going on? We can't deal with this. They're grumbling in their tents against God, saying, oh, he just brought us out to die. And again, they've been complaining this whole time. And Moses tells them, he's like, hey, God is going to go into battle with you. We can take it. We can do this. Like, let's go up and take the promised land that has been set aside for us. And Caleb and Joshua, they also encourage the people. And the people say, no, we're not going to do it. So God's like, okay, okay, this is really how it's going to be. Like, you're not, like, I literally just went through all of that, bringing y'all out of slavery, y'all saw some crazy stuff go down with all of the plagues in Egypt. You saw that by day I was a pillar of smoke so that you would walk in the shade through the desert. You would be concealed from your enemies. And by night, I was a pillar of fire, not only to give you light, but to give you heat. Jude 1.5 tells us it was Jesus Christ who was that pillar bringing them out of Egypt. Anyway. Jesus is all throughout the Old Testament. Anyway, pre-incarnate Jesus all throughout the Old Testament. So he's like, really? You really think after I have carried you like a, a father carries his son that all of a sudden I'm not going to roll up now and y'all are just going to be defeated by giants? If that's how y'all are going to be, then none of y'all are making it into the promised land. It's going to be your kids who don't know good and evil yet. They'll go into the promised land. Caleb and jo uh, Joshua, they'll go into the promised land. But none of y'all are going to go into the promised land, including you, Moses, because of all of this that's going on right now. <sighs> I would have been so frustrated if I was Moses. Like, really? Like, I told them that they should go. Anyway, uh, God's ways are not my ways, but that's just how I feel. So anyway, Moses is reminding them of all of this. So all of a sudden... The people, when they hear God say, okay, if that's how y'all are going to be, y'all ain't getting none of this. They're like, oh, hold on. Okay, now we'll go up against the Amorites. And God tells Moses, he's like, tell them, do not go up against the Amorites because I'm not going to be in their midst. I'm not going into battle with them. They had a chance. They said, no, goodbye. We're done with this. And the people, again, they're going to do whatever they want on their own time. Oh, okay, actually, now I'll go in to the promised land and fight against the Amorites. The Amorites chased them out like bees, it says in scripture. These people were slaughtered in battle. And Moses is told by God, okay, you know what? Y'all need to just get out. You're not going into the promised land. I told y'all, y'all aren't going out. So this is something that you need to focus on when you are studying about what took place in the month of Shabbat. This whole story is being recounted to the Israelites. And here's something that you need to take away from this. Delayed obedience is disobedience. Delayed obedience is disobedience. When God tells you when to go, you go. You don't say, hold on, I'll do it when I'm good and ready. 
You do it when he tells you to do it. Because if you say, okay, I'm going to wait and then I'll do what you say. He didn't tell you to go then. He told you to go now. So if you're going on your time, game over. It's like, it's already passed. That door has passed. You've already been disobedient. You've already sinned. Don't disobey God. Okay. <laughs> Moral of the story, don't disobey God unless y'all want to be walking through the wilderness for 40 years and God's just waiting for you to croak until your offspring will get the blessings that were in store for you, but you wouldn't do it because you're going to do whatever's right in your own eyes. Take that to the bank. Remember it. Keep it in on the inside. Be obedient to God. So anyway, Moses, he's recounting this story to them and he's talking about how for years, they wandered through the desert and God directed them to go this way, go this way. And not only that, they were going through different areas that God had given to people like Esau. He gave to Lot and his sons. And God tells them, you're going to go through this area and you're going to pay for the food that you eat and the water that you drink. And you know what? You're not going to say, okay, well, God wouldn't give us this land. So we're just going to overtake these people here and take their land. We're not going to take that promise land. We're just going to take the land that's here that is convenient for us. He says, don't do that. I give it to Esau's descendants. I give it to Lot's descendants. Don't dare even bother them. You're going to pay for your stuff and then you're going to get to get in. So then after some time, um, they meet this king named King Sihon and he was an evil king and God was ready to bring judgment on his people. So he told the Israelites, okay, you're going to take this land from King Sihon. And they totally took over, uh, totally overran the cities, uh, left no survivors, no men, women, or children. And they took their livestock and then they moved on to another king named King Og of Bashan. He was a Rephaim. He was one of these giants. And God said, you can take his land as well. So they captured like 60 cities. And part of this was the inheritance given to the Reubenites. So the people from the tribe of Reuben. And uh, this is where Moses talks about how disobedient these people were and how God had waited till all the men of war, the people who had... Uh, tried to go to war against the Amorites on their own time whenever they felt like it. Now that they knew the repercussions after they had been grumbling against God, this is when he says, God waited for all of the men of war to perish because now y'all are going to get to go into the promised land. And I want y'all to remember something. Remember my words today because I've been with y'all for 40 years. I know how you act. I know how you grumble against God. I know how entitled you are. Oh, I don't want to eat pheasants. I'm tired of manna. Like, I know how y'all are. So get out your pen and paper. Remember this, Israelites, before y'all walk into the promised land, because I can't go because of all y'all's attitude. Remember this. Don't get involved with idolatry. Don't get involved in idolatry. Don't be ensnared by the idolatry of all of the people groups around you. Because there's one God and he doesn't share his worship with anybody else. Y'all take that to the bank. God doesn't share worship with any of these spiritual deities. He is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And he is above all of them. So you can't dine at the table of demons and dine at the table of the Lord. You can't drink from the cup of demons and drink from the cup of the Lord. As we've been talking about for a year. Remember that. You can't do both. And he said, here's the deal, you guys. I know y'all are going to go into the promised land and you know what you're going to do. I know how y'all are. Eventually, your kids are going to fall into idolatry and God is going to scatter them. And when he scatters them, I want them to remember something. Repent, repent, and God will be faithful and come back to you. But I want y'all to teach this to your children and your children's children don't get involved in idolatry. Don't get involved in idolatry. I know you guys are going to, but don't get involved in idolatry. And then afterwards, you know, Moses, he looks out, he's on the mountain. He, he gets to see the land, but he doesn't get to go into the land. So he goes up the mountain and then he dies. And then Joshua is going to lead the people into the promised land. They have to do all of these agreements, which we've talked about 
right up here for everybody on desktop and mobile. And um, they have to make agreements. They're making covenant. Like, no, I will not do this. No, I will not do this. And yes, I will do this. And yes, I will do that. And then they go in and they are into the promised land. So that is the big thing that happens during the month of Shabbat. The whole book of Deuteronomy is given. Now that was kind of an overview of the first four chapters and then some of the later chapters, but that's in general what Deuteronomy is all about. And that's what happened. We were given this book, these sermons during the whole month of Shabbat, starting on the first day of the 11th month, which is Shabbat. So you will see 11th month. If you type that in over in first Chronicles, uh, this is the second time you will see it in your Bible. And this is when uh, King David is making different divisions on when people in the military are going to serve, depending on which tribe they're in. So you're just going to see one small little thing saying like, in the 11th month, such and such tribe is going to serve. It's their division to serve in the military. Um, the third time that you are going to see the 11th month, which is Shabbat, is going to be in Zechariah chapter one. Again, I think it's verse seven. And I have been listening to not only Zechariah, but I listen to Zephaniah, I listen to Haggai, and then I was listening to Zechariah so that I could tell you kind of like the backstory of what's going on. So again, like Moses said, I know how y'all are. I know you guys are an idolatrous people and you guys constantly fall back in to forgetting the God who brought you up out of Egypt. You grumble against him. You get ensnared by all of the idolatry around you. It happened, of course. People don't change. There's nothing new under the sun, according to King Solomon and Ecclesiastes. So God's people, they're idolatrous. They are <laughs> taken into captivity, right? And now, after 70 years in captivity, they are released. And during King Darius's reign, the second year, um, Zechariah, along with the prophet Haggai, the book before him, they are giving prophecies to God's people because everybody's all excited because, hey, now we're out of Babylonian captivity. And what do they do? Are they ready to serve God? No, they're after their own affairs. And God's like, ah, hold up. Y'all are going to build your house while my house is in ruins. I don't think so. Like, I don't think so. Why is it y'all cry? Oh, God, please save us, save us, save us. Nobody wants to be under, you know, um, the rule of somebody else. But when God's like, okay, I will put you back in your promised land, they forget about God and they're just about their own business. And he's like, hold up, no. So they are going to rebuild the temple. And Zechariah comes out with prophecies in the 11th month on the 24th day. God gives him a vision of how God is sending his angels out to give him a report of the things that he sees on earth. And he has seen that people have been idolatrous. Zechariah tells them to turn away, to repent, to remember the God who was the one who made covenant with their forefathers. And then afterwards, um, he sees this vision, these angels are going out, they come back, they give a report to God about what's going on and how, yes, God used uh, foreigners to basically do his will and discipline Israel. He disciplined Judah by taking them into Babylonian captivity. But the thing is, as these people who are not God's people went an extra step further and they went to an extreme, they went and did more than what God told them to do in no uncertain terms. And they capitalized on the fact that Israel and Judah were disobedient and they went to an extreme and they did more than they were supposed to as part of, you know, disciplining through God's right hand. And so God was going to bring judgment on those foreign nations. And when he sent out those angels to give them a report to see what has been going on on the earth, they said that they saw that these nations are relaxed. They are at rest. And he's like, no, nope, that's not going to happen anymore. And he sees how these four horns or these four kingdoms have had evil plans for God's people. And he's like, nope, we're putting a stop to it. I remember my people and I am going to 
basically make them prosper again. And this is the prophecy that we see in Zechariah that was given during the month of Shabbat. Again, God's people constantly falling into idolatry and God is faithful to them. But we know that eventually God gives Israel a certificate of divorce. And we know from scripture that you can't go and remarry somebody that you've been divorced from in scripture when they have been one flesh with another. So uh, we know Israel and her sister Judah played the harlot. If you guys want to read Ezekiel, I think it's Ezekiel 23. Um, so God's new bride is the church. And we see that he's coming back and he will not tolerate idolatry. He will not tolerate adultery from his people. And this is why we have to be careful to not be ensnared by the nations around us. We cannot be ensnared by the idolatry of the people around us, even if those people are our own families. Because we see that God's people are not his people because of their bloodline. Remember, he says, I can... I can raise up children for Abraham from these stones. It's those who belong to Jesus are heirs according to the promise, as we see over in Galatians 3. Not all of Israel belongs to Israel. Jesus was that offspring of Abraham uh, when he came down, left his position in heaven, was born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, went through all the th trials and tribulations that we go through, but he knew no sin, went to the cross, defeated death, Satan, etc., rose again. And that is why we can have right standing with God. So, um, <laughs> Christians, Jesus is returning. And if we would like to be heirs according to the promise, then we have to hold fast to Jesus Christ. And we can't hold fast to Jesus and hold fast to demonic gods. We know scripture tells us that anybody who loves their father or mother or brother or sister more than they love Jesus is not worthy of him. And that Jesus tells us to pick up our cross and follow him. We have to die to ourselves every single day. And we see in the month of Shabbat, God's people constantly disobeying him. They constantly fall back into idolatry and then they wonder why things are bad. Let's prevent all of the bad stuff by just being obedient in the first place. Let's learn from other people's mistakes as we meditate on the word of God and we hold fast to Jesus. We hold fast to the truth. We hold fast to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords because we know that Satan's time is short, that Jesus is returning, where he is going to make this world that is under Satan's authority because we know uh, Satan is the God of this world that Jesus is returning and he is going to make the kingdoms of this world the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. So whose side do you want to be on? Do you want to be somebody whose name is forgotten? The ones who turned aside from their first love, Jesus Christ, and they are going to fall away. They're going to get involved with all sorts of idolatry because it's easier to be a friend of the world then follow God. Remember, God says, those who are a friend of the world are at enmity with God. So make a decision, Christians. Are you going to follow God with your whole heart? As it tells us in Deuteronomy, love the Lord with all your heart, your mind, and soul. Are you going to fear the Lord? Where scripture tells us that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Make a decision, Christians. Who are you going to serve? Because time is short. Jesus is returning. And we want him to say, well done, my good and faithful servant, rather than depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. I never knew you. Make a decision, Christians. And I hope you guys would like, subscribe, and share. And have a wonderful month of Shavat moving forward. And I will talk to you guys later. Bye.